What's up, everybody? Welcome to The Stack. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. Sup, I'm Pete. And on The Stack, we talk about a bunch of books that have come out this week. We got a bunch of big kickoffs to events happening. So let's oh, kick it off. Uh, this is our it. number one. This is the stack number one. Let's call it that. Let's rebrand. Yeah, reboot Everyone's it, doing reboot it. it. Yeah, let's New do number it. one. This is the stack number one. We're strangers. Let's start over. Nope. Hello. Great to meet you guys. Let's talk comics. I don't like comics. The end. Titans Beast World number yeah! one. DC Comics. Written by Tom Taylor. Art by Ivan Rice. This is picking right up on a bunch of stuff that has been happening in the main Titans title, where the Titans have been dealing with the Church of Blood, is now called the Church of Eternity. It's been taken over by these weird, flowery, alien spore type things. Big spoilers for the issue here, but we find out that they are caused by something called the Necrostar, and the Necrostar mm. is basically a Starro, but worse. Is worse, pointier, worse? so much spinier pointier. and and more creepy looking. It looks like a you know one of those centipede kind of uh, things. So over the course of the book, the Necro Star they discover can only be stopped by Starro. They don't have Starro on hand, but so they instead, got Garo. They got Garo. Beast Boy turns into a Starro and attacks him and saves everybody, which is great. Up until Doctor Hate arrives. And Dr. Uh, hate, hate corrupts this guy. Him, hate. And everybody in the world, pretty much, I assume, gets turned into half beasts, half humans. Pete, I want you to kick this off because I am so surprised you. Yeah. Know. This is Thank not you. a Pete, no, ne it's not. necessarily a Pete W here. Well, I, I thought it was fun. I really liked the big swings it was taking, all the twists and turns, because you thought, like, Okay, all right. So he's going to turn into a giant Starro, but it's Garo, and he's going to and but it just kept getting crazier, which I was impressed with. I I, I felt like, you know, I also love the Raven and uh, Beast Boy relationship, so I was re really digging the stuff that was happening there. Yeah, I just think that that this is kind of. Uh, a great start uh, to something. The last couple of issues have been really interesting, and so this whole Beast World kickoff uh, was kind of cool, and I felt like they did a great job of kind of like building momentum to this kind of big Beast World reveal. And, uh, yeah, I thought it was done well in a ton of action, and, uh, yeah, I just felt like it had good art, good storytelling, and kind of a fun, fun idea to explore. I just feel like Tom Taylor is sort of like T. in the TT's in the pocket right now, just like yeah. able to just write any superhero story with the right amount of pacing, character work, and plot is is just in perfect sync, and yeah. that is so hard to stay there for a long time as a comic book creator. I feel like, and, and Tom Taylor is doing it, and this is great. There's so much like emo so many emotional moments here, like you're saying between Garth and Raven. Uh, the story is really has some fun twists and the narration has dread that is building throughout. And this is an event. Uh, it's I, in a lot of events. There's been so many mini events throughout Marvel and DC for the past like two or three years. And this is one that feels like a bigger event that is completely story driven. And so mm -hmm. that that is also rare. And I'm very excited to move through this event. One of two events I'm actually pretty excited about in this stack. And this is the first one. Uh, Alex, I know you haven't said anything yet, but just before we move on, uh, Justin brought up the, the TT pocket. And I just think that Tom Taylor has such range. And anytime I see his name on something, uh, I'm there because it's really for years, it, he's been killing it and uh, really impressive how whether it's Marvel or DC, the character exploration, the story, the pace, like Justin's saying, it's just really impressive. So I just want to take yep. a moment while we're talking about the Tom Taylor pocket and just kind it's of, a pocket that's been heating up for a while, like Pete's saying. And yeah. I think it's a hot pocket. Uh, there's nothing this better than a hot pocket. This is a hot pocket. Are we yeah. calling it? Are we calling this is a hot, a this is a hot, I mean, this is the first CBC time we ever do drop, the stack, so I feel like, is that a thing we that we do? Yes. On we the choose a hot pocket every, every episode. Every <laughs> episode, we talk about the hottest pocket. Who's in the hot pocket? Yeah, I got to say, this is a hot pocket. I agree with you guys. I have a hot pocket. Hot I, I didn't want to wrap up, Pete, because I have a bunch of thoughts that I want to throw out there about this book. One thing that I wanted to throw out there is this feels like 
a Tom Taylor alternate universe event that is actually set in the main DC continuity down yes. to the structure. Feels like a Dark Knights of Steel. Feels like a DC type thing. And these down- are all fun events. Yeah, which are super fun. I love all of them. I had a blast reading this. I thought this was great. The only little quibble that I have nah, is I really am tired little. of his narration thing, where he's like, and if we only knew then the terrible thing that was about to happen. Well, here it is. Where it just, it's feeling a little tropey to me now with his stuff, where it, I, I'm okay with it when I'm reading Deceased. I'm okay with it when I'm reading Dark Knights of Steel, because he writes it in very flowery medieval language. I didn't need it as much here. Um, so that distracting interesting agree to disagree well, it's pretty I, I i hear you on that like to have something but that's part of the pocket is you have like a thing you do <laughs> i uh, need a pocket. warm voice in a hot pocket bro you know what i mean yeah. come on well yeah, now Pete, exactly this is gonna be okay except it isn't ah! well but i don't know i would not characterize it in that same way because i think this is about uh sort of stories and like when it happens once it happens again something that is also a bit done Mm -hmm. but i i just thought it worked here because it helped us with the surprises it gave us a little bit of a nod to it and then the twist came in in sort of different ways Mm -hmm. and even dr hate was like i know my name's dumb but it is my name. I'm <laughs> killing you. A <laughs> couple more things that I want to say. I agree with you guys 100% on the Gar and Raven relationship. This is another thing that Tom Taylor does very well. He usually relies on Black Canary and Green Arrow in every one of his books. And to be clear, that's not a knock. I love to it every clear. single time. But he knows you need an emotional relationship to hook into here to actually care about these characters. Also love DC doing a Titans event. This is the first time in history that has ever happened where they've had a universe-wide event hooked on the Titans. So that's great. Really doubles down on the fact that they're the new Justice League. Will that stick? No. But for now, let's keep going with it. That's good. Uh, Can we talk about Dr. Hate, though? Uh, Mm, What's going on here? Like, who is Dr. Hate? How dumb is his name? What's happening? <laughs> if you have a dumb is, what's name, happening? if you what's well, happening, what happens? Well, if you have a but if you have a dumb name, like I think it's fine to say, like I know my name, my name is dumb. Like it's fine to take ownership of that. Yeah, right? that's but who the thing. is this? Because the initial tease at the end of the last event after the uh, everybody is up all night with nightmares event. What was it called? Night terror. That was called. I think that was the title. It was called Everyone's Up All Night. Night Terrors, when they revealed that he was working for Amanda Waller. He, the implication was he was a hero. Everybody knows that he's like, it's time for heroes to end. That's Amanda Waller's whole thing. Here, he takes off his mask. And he's like, got to turn you into a star all permanently, Gar. It's me. And Gar's like, you? So he knows him. Who is it? Who, what's your theory? I don't know. It's Dr. I... Fate from another universe that's more of a Skeletor type of creature. No, it's. I feel like it's someone like nice. Uh, Pushing my Skeletor agenda, like Max Lord. I feel like it's someone like yeah. that. Uh, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Ambush bug. Yeah, that's sort of a, a bit of a reach, mm-hmm. perhaps. But um, but I guess we'll uh, see about that. I also want to say just something else. I liked. I liked Garth being like, sort of knowing he's on a big stage. Being like, ah, I think I have a plan, but it's a bad plan. And then yep. going through with it, it was a bad plan in its conclusion, but also in the process, it's rare to see a hero being like, this is, I'm not good at this. I, this hurts. I'm bad at this. And then succeeding and then failing. And that seeing that process is such a nice part of this event. Well, and also it's a nice it's a nice nod to the corporate ladder. Like we all know, you got to become a whale before you become a giant star, you know? Yeah. Well, you've got to right. size up, dude. You can't just go from Beast Boy to, to Starro. You got to kind of get warmed up a little bit. You know what I mean? We've all seen a star is born, but have we seen a whale is born? <laughs> no. And we need to. That's the prequel. Let's move on and talk about the other big event that's prequel. kicking off this week The Amazing Spider Man Gang War First Strike, number one from Marvel. They got to use all the words in that title. Written by Zeb Wells with Cody Ziegler. Art by Joey Vasquez and Julian Shaw. The gangs of New York, not to be confused with the movie by Myron Scorsese, are all going Mm. to war here in the Marvel Universe with um, Spider-Man and a bunch of other heroes caught in the middle. 
Uh, Pete, you have a question. Yeah, I'm just worried about you guys in New York City right now because damn shit is going down. I hope you guys are safe uh, because yeah. after reading this issue, I'm, I'm worried about you. I think I'm in the area on the map where the <laughs> bumblers in charge. So oh, did you do that? So I definitely looked at that. I was like, "Ooh, where do I live? Hobgoblin, Hobgoblin." Oh church. no! Well, cool. <laughs> let me be honest. It's a little bit off the map where I live. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, Marvel. Yeah, Put I don't think that's map. to scale. I don't think that's to scale. But yeah, I feel like I'm in bumbler area, uh, so that's fun. <laughs> he sounds easy to defeat, so I think I'll be fine. <laughs> Justin, it sounds like you were all in on this event, potentially. Well, I'm not saying I'm all in, but I will say I think we've all been critical about um, some of the recent goings-ons in the uh, ma main Amazing Spider-Man book. But this and then the, the two books we're going to talk about later, I actually thought I, I like the uh, sort of we're getting to see these characters. This reminds me of classic Spider-Man events like the uh, what was the one from years ago with uh, where like Moon Knight, the Punisher, where everyone was like running on rooftops, hanging out. I'll look it up. Civil uh, but, War? No, uh, from the comics. Uh, Mark Maximum Bagley was Carnage. No. OK, great. This is not helpful. Uh, but I, I do like that. It feels like a classic crossover event in uh, in a good way, even though it's not doing it we're not seeing a ton of heroes yet it really is just like everyone's in there working together everyone's sort of in their own uh pocket right now but i i like each of the positions everyone's in and this are we feels sponsored like by hot pockets i just don't know we will be after episode one of the stack today yeah episode. if i could just get free hot pockets i feel like we've made it that is a death sentence, <laughs> a death sentence <laughs> for you. Uh, but no, I really like the way that this is sort of uh, <laughs> resetting Spider-Man in a in a good way in this this particular I, issue. I agree. Spider-Man's been all over the place, and uh, this is kind of a nice little bit of a reset here. Even though it's kind of uh, we're kicking off um, an event. Uh, but yeah, I agree. I think this did a great job of kind of setting things up, getting you excited about what's to come. Um, yeah, I, I'm a, I'm not excited about the title, but I do think that it's uh, it, it's high stakes, which is cool, and I like it bringing uh marvel characters together um especially new york related ones so yeah i think this is doing a, a good job and i i think this is great art and uh i'm excited to see how this goes the crossover i was talking about was uh, round robin the sidekicks revenge featuring oh, i thought um, it was shadowland no, uh, i everyone. thought it was round robin the sidekicks revenge but i know you didn't that. no you didn't it was spider-man the punisher nova dark hawk moon knight Love if i man. had all the time in the world i still wouldn't have been able to get that i liked individual scenes in this issue but i'm not totally enthused about this event still uh, the idea of like hey it's a bunch of fun gangsters killing people and blowing up new york uh, i don't know it makes me a little uncomfortable <laughs> to be honest with you. as yeah. a resident as yeah. a resident, yeah. resident of new york makes me like, feel man, weird this is not something that anymore. i'm like oh fun times but individual seeds in here i thought really popped really like the scene of miles digging into peter yes that yes. was great very I thought good. That was very good and very well yeah. done um, I also, I loved, spoiler here for the end, but we find out that Hammerhead's girlfriend, who we picked up at a wedding a couple of issues back, is actually Madame Mask, who faked Ooh, her own death. Fun reveal. Love that. Madame Mask, great character. Like, great, very dangerous character. And also, it's a great way to take out Hammerhead. You know what I mean? I thought well, that was really- Well, and also, going back head. before that, <laughs> I liked all the stuff with Beetle and her husband, who she never married, uh, Robbie Robertson's son, who I'm forgetting the name ben. of. Ben. Ben Robertson? Ben. Really? I believe so. Yeah. I Named believe after so. Ben Urich, I assume? Weird. Yeah. Wow. Huh. Strange. Anyway, uh, love the emotional stuff there. I think that really <laughs> hit very nicely. Um, the stuff that didn't work for me as much was- Spider-Man coming in later to Luke Cage and being like, hey, I'm ready to help. And Luke was like, the city is blowing up, you idiot. He's like, no problem. Going to put together a team. And I was like, that that's something that I felt like if it came. Okay. So it's Randy. It's not Ben. It's Randy. Randy. Okay. That makes a little more sense. Um, 
I would have liked to see that team by the end. I know we're building up to that. Yeah, but... it's a, yeah, there's a lot of, yeah, 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 yeah. I guess, a... but in the solicit, the concept is, I guess, spoilers here, that Spider-Man is like, I'm going to put together a team to stop this gang war in 48 hours. That's great. But it's weird to read the pilot of something and then be like, we're not going to give you the concept. That comes later. Check it out later. We're going to build to that. Like, just give me that concept up front so I can be like, cool, that's what this event is about. Yeah, but I don't The The event is about a gang war. Like, I don't know. It's I not. The you're, gang you're war is too deep. out of control. That is not like a gang war. That's like a legit war that is happening in the streets of New York City. It is that's OK. That, that's basically what the, I don't know why you're quibbling about. Like, hey, it's not you need a better word. <laughs> for I ran war. a gang that's not out. I do it. But uh, this reminds me of like the big like Batman DMZ and like those larger sure. like devastating events, which I think is a good well, they thing. call out. They're like, oh, you weren't here for the last gag war. There was a previous gag war event running through the Spider-Man books. And that's what this is. But that was a little more like kingpin mm -hmm. like snobby upper echelon that's what this i want is i want snob legit. stuff you want snob stuff yeah, yeah you i want, want to the, be like, the oh, salt bird, salt bird of events wow alex what a hit you're so topical especially on episode one and <laughs> real quick before we move on shout out to the slippy guy that spider-man's fighting oh, slide Ooh, is that the guy from um the watchman hbo tv show yeah, yeah, it's a crossover. No. Same guy, absolutely. No. Yeah. Same guy. It kind of is, but that's funny. His name is Slide, which is very dumb. Let's talk about Berserker, Fallen Empire, number one from Boob Studios, written by Matson Tomlin, art by Rebecca Isaacs. This is part of a series of one shots that Boom Studios is putting out that focus on Keanu Reeves' character, this immortal berserker who has to kill people. There's a surprising amount of important mythology that, frankly, I did not know about this berserker that comes out in this book over the uh, the. Uh, span of this dark fable that we're telling. This is also of note, Matson Tomlin, who is writing, I think it's called A Vicious Circle over at Image Comics that we've loved, this time travel wild yeah. thriller with Lee Bermejo, I think. And mm. uh, he is also writing The Batman 2. So there you go. Shouts to that. Wow. Um, this, I, I, I don't know if this is 100% canon across all of Berserker, but... Yeah. It really play his the way his powers work um, because I think he has a little bit more control over them in the main series that ended. But I thought this was dying? great. Are you okay? Yes, dying a I'd little. I really bit. hate I'm, if you died on the first episode of. No, I'm berser I'm berser I like a berserker. So if I die, it's fine. I'll just go oh, like, okay, cool, real fast, and fight with a chain, perhaps. Uh, but this, <laughs> I think, really, it was just a great story. Great it was twists and tale. turns. It feels like a feature film uh, mm -hmm. version of the character, something that I think we've seen a very episodic version and some good comic book stuff. But this, to me, felt like a The Mummy style feature film uh, with just like a just great beginning, middle and end throughout. Yeah, I agree. This was uh, epic, uh, amazing art, absolutely uh, super tight bananas over here. I mean, this is a tight package. You're getting a lot in this comic. It's a full-on story from start to finish tons it's of a twists story and, it's tons of twists and turns sometimes in one issue justin they start an arc and you don't get to kind of finish it but this is the whole thing here so yeah uh go fuck yourself i didn't criticize your bullshit I and said so any middle and end so we get we're in the same space okay all right <laughs> anyways i i very much enjoyed this uh, it's kind of a different uh, version of the Ber Berserker a little bit, but it really still feels like it and uh, was just such a cool uh, kind of one shot to kind of read and have a one and done with a Berserker. So, yeah, I, uh, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. There's a part of me when I read these one shots that gets a little bummed because Matt Kent and Ron Garney aren't involved. And I'm like, but they mm. made this thing. Let them be part of it. But... Like you guys are saying, Matson Tomlin has crafted this really interesting story that I would 
I would even call it like a Tales for the Crypt style thing, but maybe not straight as like goofy horror necessarily. Like, yeah. is that because the, it's the not a fucking B movie? Story yeah, has a funny. Yeah, 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 it is. Yeah, I mean, it's who who's got who got your nose is sort of an underlying theme of it. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I really right. pulled that out as well. Rebecca well, Isaac Isaac Shyamalan Shyamalan is great style. and bloody and gross, but I think what this points to, without getting too into the larger world of it, we know there is going to be a Berserker film at some point. We also know they're working on an anime for netflix if the anime is like done in one stories of berserker this is really selling me on that idea is keanu reeves going to be berserker I, yeah you know <laughs> Can you it'd, it'd be crazy. Be. It'd be crazy be if wild. it wasn't it. Uh, he, he was like, sorry, get... it's Miles Teller. It's Miles Teller. <laughs> <laughs> Can't you see in this comic book from yeah. Whiplash? He's been drawn exclusively <laughs> like Keanu Reeves. It'd be I know, but... Absolutely insane. Uh, but sometimes when that changes and they make a movie or something... Sorry, Keanu auditioned and Seth Rogen auditioned and went to Seth. Seth going to be Berserker. <laughs> they loved his voice. They loved his voice. I will mention, even if Who you haven't it? read the Berserker series, if you want to see a, a hardcore Berserker-style t- tale, like a Conan-style thing that has some sci-fi, mystical fantasy elements to it, definitely pick this up. This is great. Batman yes. 89 Echoes, number one from DC Comics, written by Sam Hamm, art by Joe Sam Conan. Sam Hamm! This is... Technically, an in-canon continuation of the Michael Keaton, Tim Burton Batman movies. There was a previous Batman 89 series that ended with Batman agreeing to not be Batman anymore. So, spoiler, he doesn't show up here in this first issue. He's not in this. He's not in this. But instead, we're getting a lot of different villains juggling here. We're getting to see their version of a Scarecrow, their version of a Harley Quinn, Firefly, a bunch of others. Um, And it's all, for me... Even beyond Sam Hamm, who wrote the movies, hooked on Joe Canonis's art. I could look at Joe Canonis's art all day. It's great. Well, just to, going off of that, the way that uh, Joe captures all the movie characters that we see and then creates the new characters that we didn't see in the original movie in the style, like uh, it very, there's very much a Madonna in this. Mm-hmm. A Madonna playing, is it Harley Quinn? Yeah. Harley uh, Quinn, in a yeah. great way. So, like, just really smart from an artistic point of view to use, like, 80s versions of celebrities as if the movie itself was continuing on from a casting perspective, I thought was really cool. And I thought this was well done. It feels like a pretty, like, knowing adaptation of what a future movie would have looked like if it was in this vein. It doesn't, it just, is written as if we all know what's happening top of our intelligence. I love that. Nothing's over explained yeah, and we're just moving nice. into some exciting stories. So I thought this was great. I, I agree. I really thought this was fun. Um, I just wish someone would have told me ahead of time, like don't keep looking for Batman in this because uh, Batman's not in this. And mm-hmm. if I could have taken that, uh, away, I could have just really enjoyed this. Um, yeah. Batman's never coming back at any point. No, He's gone. We won't see him. We won't see that guy, that Batman. Uh, Anyways, yeah, just really well done. Great art. Yeah, I I agree with you guys. I was beyond the Joe Canonis art. I was just very surprised by this. I kind of went in with like a little stink of like, how is this possibly going to be good? A fourth quote unquote Batman movie that's in the comics. Alex, you went in with a stink. I went to Don't go stink. in with a stink. I went come out with, with a stink. stink. Uh, no, I came, with a stink. Attitude. I came out with an air freshener is how we refer to it. Yes, a non-stink, a reverse stink, a yeah, fresh. Anyway, There's really enjoyed this as fresh. well. I was very pleasantly surprised. Let's move on to one of my most anticipated issues of the oh, week yeah. that I would say did not disappoint. X-Men Blue Origins, number one from Marvel, written by Cy Spurrier, art by Wilton Santos and Marcus Toe. If you haven't been reading Uncanny Spider-Man, this is a essential chapter of that to the point that we've been watching Nightcrawler. He's dressed in a Spider-Man costume. He's hiding out from Orcus. He is in New York, and Mystique has been running around asking where her baby is. Who? Where's my know? baby? Where's my baby? I, I want, want my, my baby, baby back. back. Baby back, baby back. Ribs. Riblets. 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 Yeah. Uh, and Riblets? <laughs> it's a crossover. Wow. Podcast. Man. Uh, anyway, 
we as comic book readers know that nightcrawler has always had a convoluted continuity but that he is the son of mystique and azazel a red demonic looking immortal mutant um this issue posits what if that wasn't true and what if in fact we retconned several things about nightcrawler's origin as we find out how mystique survived the hellfire gala and also nightcrawler's real parentage I'm sure we're going to get into spoilers here, so turn away if you don't want to know. Um, but I thought this was phenomenal as usual. I loved the conceit that Cy Spurrier puts in here, where he sets it up in a way with this Banff character that's been appearing through Uncanny Spider-Man, who very, in a meta fourth wall breaking way, lays out the bare minimum of information we need to know to read this issue. And is like, Oh, there's some other stuff you need to that's happening, but like, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. And it keeps cropping up and it keeps pushing it down. So it's definitely a richer read if you've been reading Uncanny Spider-Man. Yeah. But if you're just a fan of Nightcrawler, if you're a fan of Mystique, this is a stunning issue that completely oh. redefines the stories of both of those characters and how they're intertwined, as well as the third character. I'm sure we're going to mention it in a second. Fantastic. I agree. This was just such a great read. And this and another book we're going to talk about in a bit just proves, and the books we talked about in the recent episodes of the stack that have been retconned because this is number one, it makes us uh, definitely Psy guys. We're just a couple, of, a trio of Psy guys and, uh, when it comes Psy, to Psy Spurrier. Psy oh, Psy, Psy, Psy Spurrier, Spurrier oh, you yeah. asshole. <laughs> what about our secret code word where we're like, uh, Psy guys. That's how we greet each other. Yeah, we talked uh, about that on the pre-show before we did this first show. I remember first that. episode. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, during the fatality meeting, you asshole, come on. <laughs> good. Oh my god, this is good. Too many this references to our live show. Uh, the way that this uh, book uses all the characters that you mentioned, Alex, and finds new, interesting backstory, a retcon story that I think is just great super interesting and also just the extension of mystique's mutant powers and the lecture that she sort of gives about it i just loved that top to bottom this and the sort of home book of this uh, uncanny spider-man i have been some of my top of my stack reads if you're not reading this definitely check it out as like the the way the the fall of x is going which is a lot of big story this is such a just dropping a pin. Hey, are you a Psy guy, Pete? Yeah, I'm usually a Psy guy. Uh, can, Adam, you Psy. You guys have been going on for 20 minutes here. Let's can I, fucking wrap You talked forever up. about, I don't know, something earlier in the stack. Can I say one more thing before you crap on this book? Um, I And this is going to get into spoilers. I also think this is a important comic. And the reason mm. I think it's oh, important fuck, comic. Oh, fuck yourself. Nope. You're going to hear this and then you're going to feel bad about it, Pete. I know you very well, even though this is the yeah. first episode we've ever recorded. The reason this is important is because it comes out over the course of the book that they they basically retcon Destiny, who is the one true love of Mystique in the current continuity, into her back continuity. So when Mystique was living in a castle and having a affair with Azazel, she was actually with Destiny. It's a whole plot by Destiny. You don't have to worry about it. It's very complicated. But the important part here is they are so in love, they decide to have a child at some point. So though we don't get to see it, essentially what happens is we find out the Mystique is not just a shapeshifter, she is a gene shifter. So presumably she turns into male shape and is able to inseminate Destiny so that Destiny yeah. is able to carry the child. They both look pregnant at certain points. But the, th yeah. the reason I say this is important is because it really drives home very deeply the idea of gender and gender being a construct it drives home to the point that like nightcrawler tries to define it and be like oh so you were mystique was like stop being so foolish stop being so stupid this is what i am what i am and what i am so without explicitly saying it it's speaking to non-binary readers it's speaking yeah. to um, other readers of other sexualities and it's such I talk about this all the time, but to see the growth from North Star coming out and be like, I am gay and I have AIDS. Hello. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> to yes. decades later, having a really nuanced conversation about how sexuality and gender works. I was bowled over by that. Oh, 
Well, and I would say just adding to that, like it's not at all preachy. It's yeah. part of the story and ex- and and a perfect extension of the story that doesn't feel like it's it's an add on. And I agree with you. I thought it was really beautifully done, and just the way it. The, their Destiny and Mystique's relationship is played out here is also uh, outside of the gender construct stuff, like beautifully done and complicated in a way I feel like we don't see a lot of comic book relationships. Okay, so uh, I agree with you. Uh, the gender stuff uh, uh, was great. The, you know, that, you know, yes, please, more of that. Let's, let's, let's explore have different characters go through things awesome cool uh i do disagree with you because i feel like the nightcrawler spider-man character was kind of like uh messing up and she was kind of like you know fuck you for you saying that but i think that spider-man uh nightcrawler character like us didn't understand her powers or or what she could was capable of so i think there was a kind of like learning of like oh you can do that that's awesome that's amazing this is the first we're hearing about it so it's a little bit like oh we didn't even know that about you so i felt like they could have been like the night recaller spider-man character could have been a little bit uh, uh that could have been that part could have been a little bit better so it wasn't like you're dumb you don't know my power set and, and instead of like it being kind of like you're you don't have a dick how did you make a baby you know what i mean like it came off a little bit like that which i understand like you know uh people presume things and uh, and just on appearance and stuff like that but also it gets a little weird where she's like, uh, or they are maybe, uh, you know, can change gender. So it was like, we both carried the baby. And I was like, well, how does, I, I mean, that well, sounds amazing, but like, that's a I, th- I like think the idea, drop and not a kind of like explain it all. You know what I mean? I, I think the idea there just, sorry to interrupt, but I, I think the idea is that Mystique is having a sympathetic pregnancy. Like she didn't yes. necessarily carry the baby. Destiny For appearances. Baby. For yes. appearances. Exactly. Like she would wander around town and be like, oop, I'm pregnant. So that eventually when they had the baby, it would make sense to people in the town. Uh, but then ultimately, you have that lovely moment towards the end where she's like, no, I didn't want this to be a lie. I wanted my child to see me for the first time. So I understand what you're saying, Pete, but I think that gets into that complex relationship and that these characters aren't faultless. Like Destiny isn't faultless. Mystique isn't faultless. Nightcrawler even is like fumbling around in the dark being like, what is happening here? I thought my entire life, these two people were my parents and I'm finding out something entirely different. So... Um, also, the way it started was a little kind of like she seemed like a crazy person wandering around going, where's my baby? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Where we were kind of like, what the fuck are you talking about? Well, we eventually find out, though, that Charles Xavier broke her brain. So you must have loved that because he turns out very poorly by the end of this issue. I, yeah, I'm really, uh, you know, revealing that Charles Xavier is more of a dick than we even uh, knew about is that's at this point it's like jesus christ how's this guy the leader anyways i i also want to just kind of talk about like i the the kind of the the guts of what you're saying is true i just wanted that instead of it being like a story where mystique's crazy we don't know what's going on it would have been awesome if mystique was like hey, I'm going to tell you this awesome thing about me and, you know, the powers Mm. that I have and what we're doing. And it kind of be a little bit more of a cool story than it being like, we don't know if she's out of her gourd or what's going on. And then kind of like, we're worried about her and her kind of mental state while all this is happening. I, I, and I know that there is complexity there and interesting kind of points of view with that, but I wanted to kind of be on Mystique's side more, and I felt like I wasn't. So mm. I, I don't know. I just felt like mm. it would have been more interesting. It, it felt to me like it was a little bit of like Mystique stumbling around, yelling at people about a baby that we didn't know about, and then uh, and then kind of like this huge swings, but it, it be 
uh, I don't know, told and st- I mean, it was shown, but uh, I don't know. It just right, felt no, I, a I hear lot you. I, for an issue. I feel like, and I, I, I wanted it a little bit more. We're in on what's happening instead of kind of being like, you know. I feel like there was just some setup involved there, and I think there was some connection to the fall of X with this Charles Xavier upsetting the sort of her brain to get her to this point where mm-hmm. she would reveal that because she's famously not revealing anything. And it was yeah. like Shakespearean in the way. It was very Lady Macbeth-ish, I thought, and in reading it in a way that I, I enjoyed. I also liked the way that it connected and touched on Rogue's origin here as well. Mm-hmm. So really encompassing a lot of X-Men canon. Yeah, I, I and to be clear, I hear you as well, Pete. I think like I could see how that arc couldn't necessarily work for you. It did work for me and the eventual emotional catharsis of Nightcrawler and Mystique holding each other at the end. I thought I did find very satisfying, but I get it. I, I, regardless, I think this was a complicated issue. Very well done. It took a lot of chances and I appreciate it. That it yeah, did. great read. Let's talk about another one. Alice Never After, number five from Boob Studios, written by Dan Pedosian, art by Dan Pedosian, Georgia Spoletta, and Cyril Glerum. This is the final issue of this series, which finds Alice trying to break out of her Wonderland-induced delirium. Another issue about the, babies. And to deal with the fact that babies. she has a baby. Um, this ended up much less dark than I expected it would, which I was uh, surprised about. Uh, yes, well, I think they the this issue skirts a little bit of the areas of concern that we were talking about, <laughs> uh-huh. uh, not to spoil it, but like I feel like in reading this series, like I enjoy this series. It is good. It's well drawn as well. Very fables, like a darker fables mm-hmm. that doesn't sort of make as many plot moves and is sort of sits in some different emotional and focuses obviously on Alice in Wonderland, but. Um, doesn't go to the places that we sort of predicted uh, early on correctly, but we don't get the revelations. Definitely more coming, I feel like, in this world based on the way this ends. But it was a sort of hard ending, like a quick ending to a story that um, I did enjoy. Yeah, I th- I feel like uh, they did such a great job of setting this all up. I, I wanted to sit in it a little bit more. It kind of ended uh, quickly, I agree. But I also liked the you know kind of dorothy moment of like i you you had the power the whole time to go home you know that was kind of nice and i was pleasantly surprised with how it ended yeah the way this started i was like oh shit we're in for a fucking rough ride uh so yeah art i can't say enough things i mean crazy type bananas art really just magical even that little kind of like rabbit still at the end was such a cool touch i i was just so blown away Gorgeous book. If nothing else, I mean, I wasn't, I like the first series better. I think this series meandered a little bit in terms of the story and didn't necessarily land with the point that I I was hoping it was going to end with. It's like the emotional gut punch. You wanted something horrible to happen to her? Is that what you're saying? No, I wanted some sort of like, again, this was like a very light ending of, and uh, spoiler, and she made it out of Wonderland in the end. <laughs> which is a yeah. nice happy ending um but i i wanted more of a revelation there but as is really well worth picking up and i do hope they do a third one it's sort of the thing that feels like it could use a trilogy and i would 100 percent read that yeah rule threes city boy number six city boy from dc comics written by greg <laughs> pock arc by make you young this is the last issue of this series as city boy has gone a little city crazy and is potentially going to turn all of Earth into apocalypse to welcome Dark Side down. Meanwhile, Swamp Thing is trying to stop him, and the assembled the DC comic book superheroes are also trying to believe in him and get him to believe in himself. This is a great series. I am bummed to see it go. I mean, we all know that the swamp is the opposite of the city, as city boys. uh, And I guess, Pete, you live in a swamp now, so, like, you know that the difference uh, uh, there. Uh, This series, I feel like... Yeah, we should actually mention, this is a good thing to mention on our first episode, Pete recently uh, bought a house and he was like, get me a Shrek house, which is a swamp. swamp. Yeah. Yeah. Pete loves Shrek. No doubt about that. I feel like this series, we observed City Boy a lot, but we never really got in his head. Like, we never got to really ride with him. It was a lot of, like, 
this guy's a problem. What do we do about this out of control? And we sort of hit that a lot. So it felt like we never took a step forward in that. Uh, so I would like to see more of City Boy moving into sort of the next iteration of what his powers in life could be. Uh, yeah, I really liked how this wrapped up. I, I love this overall. Um, I, you know, this was a little bit of kind of like City Boy was his powers were getting away from him. He was turning into a real douchebag, and that was bumming me out. But man, I loved how it ended. Uh, I even liked how Batman was nice. Um, so yeah, I yeah, I just don't like when people are mean to Swamp Thing. You know what I mean? It's a real uh, it's a real issue for Swamp me. Guy. I like the fact that City Boy was positioned in a way where he's not like, I'm going to be on the Justice League or the Titans now, so much as I'm just a guy who has these powers I don't know what to do with. I miss my mom, and that's pretty much it. And that's Greg Pak positioning him in a very different way from a lot of heroes. It's not even of a refusal of the call thing so much as like, I know what I know what my place is. Like my place is wandering around fighting lost things for people. That's it. I'm not the biggest superhero in the world. I'm not going to be that. This is my thing. This is what I'm going to do. So to the point that we're saying, I would love to see more adventures of him, whether they're done in one or otherwise. But I really enjoyed this series. Yeah, box great. Pox great. Minky Pox Young great. is great as well. Gang yes. War, Luke Cage, number one from Marvel, written by Rob D. Barnes, art by Ramon F. Box. This is picking up pretty directly after the end of the Gang War First Strike story as Luke Cage, who is currently the mayor of New York City, goes on a mission of his own to try to defuse the Gang War. Um, my big problem with this, and this is so stupid, well, I guess... Well. Wow, Trying to go. imagine the mayor of New York doing any of these things. <laughs> I mean, granted. You mean Mayor Eric Adams. Mayor about. Eric Adams. Here's the thing. I could see Mayor Eric Adams showing up in a costume with a mask at some point and beating people up. That would not phase me. Uh, Everything else, okay. I don't know. It doesn't work. Dude. Whatever, man. This is Luke Cage. This has nothing to do with Eric. Adams, I guess so. the fact that he's like, I don't want to do mayor stuff. I want to do vigilante stuff. Like, okay, this actually gets to the core of my problem. Is we are clearly getting to an end of him being a mayor in New York City, and they have never fully explored this. Why do we well, not well, have? I don't know if it's no, the no, end. Hold on, I'm going to say something you're going to like, Justin. Why have we not had a comic book that is Spin City but with Luke Cage? Oh, Shouts, yes. Because who's working in that office? You got a bunch of other heroes. You got, exactly. Of course, you got Iron That's Fist. Foggy. Foggy. Give everyone a title. Yeah, Foggy. it's a fun bit. Iron Fist. They're like, hey, the copier isn't working. Can you Iron Fist? And he's like, I don't have the Iron Fist. Did I you say he went, got a fist to copier? Dude, what the fuck? That's not even. He's, like the, the he's like the Fonz of the copy, the office. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Pete, you just shouted Foggy. Absolutely randomly. Foggy is not <laughs> Foggy's a civil not servant. A He's a civil servant. What the fuck are you talking about? Oh, He's yeah, not a civil like a servant. Court. He's a, a lawyer. Court spin -off. There's a night court spinoff, but with Foggy. As a spinoff. You're talking about, let's get the series going. You can't just shout Foggy randomly. I you can't sure as hell can. I can shout whatever the fuck I want. You, you were going off about Hot Pockets. out of Spin City. That doesn't make any sense continuity-wise. Pete, you're clearly, out, you're clearly out of the Hot Pocket because you don't know what you're talking about. Um, this, I enjoyed this. Uh, I don't. It's crazy to me that you're like, I just can't understand Luke Cage as the mayor fighting crime. I'm like, every superhero has a job and they fight crime everyone and yeah. they do both and it's fine and you're like mayor in charge of the city and he literally is like i'm just gonna walk around and fight some crime i'm like of course he is that's what everybody imagine does. the mayor i again we have a crazy he wears mayor. a if mask later eric adams our mayor is like legit insane like he is Stop like untethered from reality. Adams. all i'm saying is the idea that luke cage is like uh, just gonna take a couple hours while this old lady makes me a very stupid looking costume. That's you don't have time for that. You're mayor wow. in New York City. Dude. There's a lot of stuff going on. Oh my god. Stop. Alex, I did really like, I did like the thing. I did, it was a good joke 
where he was like, potholes? Come on, potholes are part of New York. Leave me alone. I was like, yeah, that's, that's true. And that's oh, real. Well. I like the way this uh, issue ended. I like the team up we have here. I did want to shout out a line that I thought was especially like, well, I don't know about this. Uh, in the beginning of the issue in um, uh, Luke Cage's sort of internal monologue, he says, Wilson Fisk left a turd in my stew with the Anti-Vigilante Act. And I was like, turd in my stew. Bummer. Because I'll tell you what, it's turd would blend in with a lot of stews. You wouldn't even see oh, it coming. That's gross, man. I don't know what you're thinking about Turd that. in my stew. I don't know if that's a common aphorism. At what point? I, at what Luke point Cage has a lot of fun. How much of the stew thing? would you have eaten at that point? Maybe all of it. A stew oh. is, you know, everything blends together. You might not even taste turd. All right. Anyways, uh, it's all been like a lot of people work a day job and get excited about going and doing other things that they're more passionate about. Like, what the I fuck is relate. your problem? I'm sorry. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Fucking guy. Uh, anyways, so, man, uh, loved how he went to Sylvia's in Harlem, dude. Oh, man, I miss Sylvia so bad. Shouts. That yeah. Shouts, dude. That fucking cornbread is fucking phenomenal. Uh, anyways, um, loved all the cameos. We got Cloak and Dagger in here. Danny Rand. You know, uh, when I see like Danny and Luke Cage, I wish Sanford Green was doing the art, but I also very much enjoyed wow. this art. Um, yeah, I think this, this was a fun kind of setup. I enjoyed this. Um, yeah. Uh, Look at I, us I, on the same page, Pete, the same love page. Uh, great. What's your take on the turd in the stew, though? You haven't really weighed in. Would that fit if you had cornbread with it? I'm, I'm not going to eat the stew. I would immediately stop eating. You'd start with, fucking... you start with you. just eat the turd on its own, and then be like, oh, "No, I'm good." I'm that's full. a good way Shut to do it. Oh, up. and let me also ask you, Pete, who's the mayor of the swamp you live in? Just so we can have an <laughs> understanding, because we talked about our mayor. Could you talk about the mayor of your swamp? Yeah, is it no is idea. it Donkey? Donkey. Donkey! <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> something is killing the children number 35 for boob studios it's the stew with, <laughs> that's what's killing the children james tide of the fourth art by werther del JT4? daria is the final issue of this arc as erica faces down with her monstrous opposites plural one who is a member of the house of slaughter i'm not 100 sure of her affiliation here the other is a literal monster who looks like her this is, I'm going to say, the most devastating issue of this series so far. Agreed. That's saying a lot. There have been a lot of devastating yeah. issues. And I enjoyed this. Like, I feel like, uh, contrary to a lot of issues in this series, a lot of stuff happens here. It's very mm -hmm. emotional. It's very well done. Yes. Huge ramifications. Uh, this is a dark title that finds new ways to kill the children. Yeah, I mean, this is great. This has just been great the whole time. JT4 has killed all of this. The art is super tight bananas. I can't recommend it enough. It's so creepy, amazing, heartbreaking, unbelievable story. Uh, very creative and inventive. Uh, yeah, I've, I've loved it all. I also, last thing I'll say that we can move on is this is oh, a great real game changing issue i would say in terms of what's going on with erica what's going on with our whole world here and i love the fact they're taking real risks with the main character in terms of changing things up um like you said without getting too much into spoilers though y'all could probably figure it out uh something is killing the children it's not going to back off from that and it's not going to back off from the emotional ramifications from that so great great issue great great series let's turn to another big one just non-stop bangers on the stack that's Action what i was saying comics, 1059 from dc comics written by philip kennedy johnson gene luan yang and dan perrin art by eddie barrows eber ferrera victor bogdanovich and marguerite savage the front story here is Superman dealing with Blue Earth, an organization who has essentially stolen his powers and is trying to replace him. They're a little bit racist towards aliens. And we get a strong, huge, huge revelation about what's actually going on here with Blue Earth and their leader, Nora Stone, by the end. And the backup stories, we get a story of Kong Keenan, uh, Ke Kenan? Uh, I, I believe Kenan is Kenan is yeah, the I don't know. pointed I really way bad should be saying it. Reading this issue because I was like, oh no, there's a whole thing about how to pronounce his name, and then we also get another story of Connor Ken, no John Ken, yeah, John, John Ken, yep. Yeah. 
John Cassius. Uh, written boyfriend. by Dan Parent yeah. of uh, Archie Comics fame. And drawn by Marguerite Sauvage, who I will beautifully do anything of. I want to talk about the front story first, though, because that is uh, such a great twist here uh, in terms of the I villain mean, reveal. Awesome. Every issue I read of Action Comics, I get a little, it's so good, I get a little twinge of sadness that PKJ is is moving off this title. Next issue. Soon, yeah. So this, I thought this revelation was great. I love the larger themes that this front story has been touching on lately of like xenophobia and and just the way that Blue Earth is setting up as a just a devastating villain here and the way that uh, i guess i won't say but the way that you can they say sort of, a spoiler warning go ahead the way that the that uh she peels off one of the members of the super family and like ah uh, it's just it's just really it's so well done eddie burrows uh and ebra ferrer's art is amazing in this just so mm. expressive and beautifully done big themes dark story like enjoyed this enjoyed the backups great cross the board superman book huh i i don't know i i felt like uh i i liked what was happening the art came off like really posy you know what i mean like hmm. sometimes it gets it's it's a little bit too much where it pulls me out of it a little bit um hmm. and is busy in ways that I, I just i don't know maybe i don't know um but we yeah have different taste I hear, you. Someone, I hear you. Someone's right and someone's wrong, and the audience will decide. But like we have, yeah, sure, 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 sure. Yeah, I, I just, uh, yeah, the blue earthers and that whole stuff. Like you know, PKJ is is the man. I, you know, I'm sad to see him go. Uh, this issue, I don't know. Um, it just uh, hmm. it missed for me a little bit. Wow. Interesting. I felt the opposite, you know, to talk about, to actually get into the spoilers here and spoiler warning, please turn away if you don't want to know, but the reveal is that Nora Stone is not her actual name. She is a character that ties back into the Batman Superman, the authority special that Philip Kenny Johnson wrote last year where Batman and Superman went to a earth in the dark multiverse where mm. Batman had married Talia al Ghul, taken over the entire planet, and ruled it in his empire of shadows. They had a daughter together. They actually had, I think, two sons as well, but the daughter is named Janin al Ghul. And that's, I believe, who Nora Stone actually is. So I loved art wise the way that they rolled out this revelation from lois being like hi that's weird she kind of looks like bruce oh, i love that. superman's stunned expression of like oh my god yeah. i know what's going on here superb and just to draw just, just not, sorry on that on that yeah. moment real quick alex to go from the macro story to that micro moment of revelation I just love it's so hard to do and mm -hmm. it's amazingly done from a writing and art perspective. Sorry. Well, the thing that I think is an even harder lift is it ties into an issue that frankly I, I don't know that I read, like or right. I read, but I don't necessarily remember. It to contrast it with something else, and this is not necessarily to slam something, but I guess I kind of am the repo reveal an amazing spider-man they were like it's this guy who approached yeah. spider-man and then showed up another time and i was like i don't remember this i don't know who this guy is here i don't know this but you feel the emotional impact and there's a difference yeah. because all the information you need to know is in this book right here to be like the way Eddie Barrows draws Superman reacted to, oh my God, this is Bruce's daughter from another reality who has been taunting us the entire time. This is bad. But the fact that you also immediately follow it up with him targeting Superman's new adopted, her targeting Superman's new adopted daughter is great. It drives the emotional stakes home, and that's the reason it works. Agree. Yeah. Loved it. Let's turn to another one then. Howard the Duck, number one from Marvel, written by Chip Zdarsky, Daniel Kimblesmith, Jason Liu, and Mary Kay. Art by, once again, Joe Canonis, Annie Wu, Derek Charm, and Will Ribson. This is celebrating the 50th anniversary of Howard the Duck. We go to a far future where Howard the Duck and his companion 
are fighting their way through a ludicrous Marvel <laughs> Comics event. They encounter Fun. a renegade watcher called the Peeper who beeps on people. Oh, oh and the Peeper shows him a bunch of wah ifs, variations of classic uh, Howard the Duck storylines that might have gone differently. I mean, what else do you want from this book, you know? <laughs> this book is fun. This book is fun. This book is funny. It's weird in a good Howard the Duck type of way. Top to bottom, there isn't, I didn't feel inconsistencies the way you get in a lot of books where mm -hmm. it is like a series of stories like this. So it really, really nicely done to, to combine everything in one package like this. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you get a great collection of stories here and it's a lot of fun. I like, I think it's the second story where it's the, the I people was it's really funny. Daniel Kimball Smith story. Yeah. 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 Great. Yeah, art great. That. And that and really awesome art. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think that there, there's a lot of, uh, bang for your buck with this and you know, Howard the duck, you can get some silly good time fun. So that really delivers. Yeah. I also had a lot of fun with this. I thought the art was great throughout. Uh, Chip Zdarsky and Joe Kanonis are sort of the iconic team on here, and they don't disappoint. But to, to your point, the Daniel Kibblesmith, Addie Wu story is also super fun. I think, is it the Jason Liu, Derek Charm one? Is that the Guardians of the Galaxy one? Or Yes. Um, yes the, also, the super ridiculous and super fun. And to your point, Justin, I totally agree. That was my impression as well, is that like, Howard's voice is consistent throughout this book, which is very hard to do. Very hard. Sorry, the Jason Liu is the X-Men one in the middle. Oh, that was also very fun as well, bringing yeah. Proteus and all the uh, jabs at X-Men. Great stuff. Very really fun. Good. And, like, yeah, good jokes throughout. And the way to, like, target continuity, like, in the Guardian story where it's like, oh, yeah, Star-Lord was dating Kitty Pride for a while. And just to, like, do that to – reference that make fun of it a little bit and then move on also hard to do yeah what was the line there's some line where it's like dating two peters is a mistake three peters is on you or something like that yes yeah, um, yeah yeah that's good good stuff yeah. slow burn number two from boob studios written by ali masters art by per luigi minotti this is per the title a slow burn crime story as a hostage situation goes horribly wrong i know you guys love this first issue how do you feel the second issue followed up? Well, this is creepy as fuck. I mean, the man kind of losing his mind as he's trying to put out a fire was uh, very intense. Uh, I think artistically it was really impressive, but um, this was like stressful to read. I don't quite know what's going on in this story, mm -hmm. but I do like the moves. I like the art. And they really want this violin. <laughs> I really like the art in particular. I agree with you on having a hard time hooking into exactly what the story is. I love the idea of a slow burn thriller, but uh, hooked around fire. But I don't know if it's quite working for me as of yet. Let's move on to talk about Alan Scott, The Green Lantern, number two from DC Comics, written by Tim Sheridan, and art by C and Tormi. We're following several different timelines. One where Alan Scott is newly the Green Lantern, the other where he is dealing with a mystery back in the day that involves potentially his old lover. And throughout it, we are dealing with the fact that uh, Alan Scott is gay. He has been closeted for most of his life. What does that mean? What does that mean for him as a hero, as a human being? Um, some very complicated stuff here, particularly as he goes through conversion therapy in this issue. Yeah. Um, so. What'd you guys think? Uh, I really enjoyed this. Uh, the title conversion, um, I think, like you said, he is in conversion therapy that he voluntarily checked into, yeah. which I thought was an interesting factor here. But I think conversion is also him becoming Green Lantern at the same time. So, like, I love that dual idea, those two ideas sort of occupying the same space. Uh, this, this story is really good. We haven't seen a lot of comics go into this part this time period this part of like uh, what happened to people and what people did to themselves and other people great uh from a green lantern perspective like this is like a whole different 
emotional version of the way that the Green Lantern, that Alan's Green Lantern powers work. And I love that. It's just really, com- really smart storytelling, combining the emotional quotient as well as the super heroics, which, as I've said a couple of times on different podcasts, hard to do. Enjoy. Uh, artistically, it's amazing. I mean, uh, I really love the art style and 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 the, as Justin is saying, just a smart use of an older character from that certain time period to have him go through this, I think, is a smart use of that. And very interesting making uh, a character that we thought we knew uh, fresh and new. So, uh, yeah, well done. Yeah, I agree with everything you guys are saying. I think it's very impressive what Tim Sheridan is doing here in terms of not shying away from the realities of conversion therapy, even though it's a superhero story, not downplaying it. And, you know, I'm beating a drum or whatever it is with dead horse mm. no, not a dead horse because it's a living <laughs> horse i'm beating an alive horse here because mm. i continue Weird to law of words <laughs> probably i didn't want to go in that direction and this but... is from the guy that said hot pocket but yeah <laughs> <laughs> DC is doing a great job of putting their money where their mouth is with their LGBTQ plus characters, which I continue to find really impressive. Like they're not just playing lip service to the fact that Alan Scott came out. They're really delving into it and what it means for the fact that he was a hero in the 1940s. So very laudable series that is also, I don't want to underplay this, fun to read. There's good superhero stuff and some killer action sequences from Sian Torby throughout. Especially to get into the nuance of the story when Alan Scott, like you referenced earlier, could have very much been that North Star, like, no, I'm gay. And then just like sort of a confession and a move on. And they actually are telling a great story about that that actually explores it, which is is commendable. Spider-Woman number one from Marvel, written by Steve Fox, art by Carola Borelli. This is the third of our issues tying into the gang war storyline, even though this is a new ongoing number one. Spider-Woman very briefly, was brought back in the web of life during Spider-Man's end of Spider-Verse. This will be good to hear explained on a podcast. So, like, yes, uh, listening, I'm all ears. I'm all ears to the web of life. Basically, Spider-Woman was brought back, but something was left behind. Potentially, that was her son, who she had, who seems to be gone. (laughs) She's trying to track him down anyway by tracking down a bunch of supervillains. And uh, yeah, and then she gets involved in gag war. (laughs) Now, are you saying the son is missing because they did that really uh, uh, hinting cut out of uh, of what a uh, person would? Yeah, it's very easy to understand, Pete. Uh, Madam Web, who is eventually going to be the feature film uh, lead of the Sony universe, um, used a magic knife that stabbed Spider Woman. They'd eliminated her from the timeline, but she was brought back by everyone else. But they didn't bring back her entire life, as her son is missing, which is a gap in her life. But she still found put his hair in her apartment briefly over here in the other <laughs> side of things. But instead of like going and chasing her son, something she really loved, she's like, "Let me fight this random guy that I know very briefly, and I had to fight him because he's someone I definitely have to fight because of the gang war." Yeah. Oh, well done, sir. Been a while since we. we I love Spider Woman. I thought Corella Borelli's art was great here. There's yes. a panel that is clearly like draw Spider Woman in a cool pose. <laughs> That's what yeah. that whole page is. Loved it. Great Spider Woman famously drawn in not great poses. Uh, you remember the flap of the cover where she's like putting her butt up and also stirring a, t- oh a sp- spine breaking thing. Yeah. Controversial back in the day. The I, I also enjoyed this. I love Spider Woman having her title, uh, and I like actually her interaction in in the gang war Diamondback stuff is really good and fun. The yeah. only thing is she's like I'm missing my child. But I got to do this gang war. I was like, you got to track down that child. (laughs) It seems like the child. Yeah. And so Um, I feel like I want that series, which I think is what this series will become. Once we get through the gang war, like the end, the end of issue reveal is like, leave diamond back to me. I was like, leave finding your son to you. (laughs) Yeah. It was driving me insane. I hate when comic books do this. I hate when publishers are like, whether it's a first issue or a second issue or whatever, use an event to launch a comic. It drives me absolutely out of my gourd. And they did that here. And to your point, the thing that suffers in this issue is the mystery with her son makes no sense. 
whatsoever. It maybe would make more sense if that was the thing we we're concentrating on. But the idea of like, ooh, I was cut out of the web of life. So my son disappeared. I'm like, I get that. That's an emotional resonance. Oh, yeah, you get then that? Then she's like- That makes sense I'm to you? Tra- well, no, 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 because like, that's a very comic book thing. Somebody got erased yeah. from continuity. I get that. But the fact that she's like, he didn't get erased from continuity. Some supervillain took him, and now I need to track down supervillains. I'm like, what is happening here? Which one is it? Make a choice. Agree completely. Like, I think- Well, I think easy- that's- I'm just saying that that's what's driving you nuts is we would have done with that, but because there's this event, they were like, Hey, uh, you've got less space for that than you. Yes. Need. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. We're in agreement. Agree. Easy fix to that. Easy fix. Next easy issue. fix to that. Start in Snope. Start in this, in the gang war and have her discover the missing son that yeah. her son is missing and comes back and that's like an understory to it but i feel like this is like the launch of this series was meant to be spider woman's back but she's missing this huge part of her life and part of all the other seasons of spider woman were building up to her having a baby in the last few years so like it makes sense as a huge part of it so it makes sense to start a series there but that but we're starting with gang war, so it's just a bad smooshing of two stories. Mm-hmm. When I think there was a better way to do it, it but also I, again, feel- I enjoyed this issue. Yeah, yeah, that's also I also really enjoyed for this sure. Issue. Say uh, uh, hat trick there, but the other thing that I'm worried about is this Hat-trick. feels like a very classic other thing that I dislike in comic books: the fact that they cannot keep ba- babies around because comic book continuity is so weird. So I think we're Alex. There's nothing weird about Madam <laughs> Webb's web of life having a magic knife cut her existence out of it, and therefore her son is removed You're from right. existence, but then captured by a supervillain. Yet his hair still around in her scrapbook or whatever. What I mean is that I feel very confident when she eventually finds her son. Her son is going to be a teenager or full grown adult, because comic books mm. cannot keep a baby or child around because it doesn't make any sense long term. So that is very frustrating. Well, it's hard to be a hero and comfortably raise a baby. Let me I know. Well, as, a, they, as a father and hero. Well, because the problem is that, like, the continuity, the four years are a month or whatever they are, but that's four years of our lives in the real world. And we're like, why is that person still a baby? What's going on here? So... Anyway, why don't we move on to Firepower number 29 from Image Comics, written by Robert Kirkman, art by Chris Sabney. In the previous issue, our Firepower holders defeated a dragon and an old guy, and now they must defeat the dragon again. Pete, you like this series. Take it away. Yes, I do. I I love the series. Uh, I'm anytime someone says Chris Samney, I'm all about it. I uh, love mm. the art style. It's really fun and great. Um, also, you know, a family that jumps out of a plane together, just ah, oh, that's just so stays uh, together. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I, I'm all for it. I don't care if a it's family silly. that jumps out of a plane together is burned together. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's Look at good. That. Huh? Fun. Anyways, uh, yeah, I just thought it was, uh, it was, uh, you know, I, I love dragons. I love Chris Samney. I, this is, I'm having a great time. I don't Pete, care if it Chris doesn't Sa- make sense. Chris Samney and I are robbing a bank tomorrow. You want to, you in? If he's going to draw it first. <laughs> <laughs> nah, he's gonna draw a gun with me, and that's how we're gonna rob the bank. Is that is that cool? Uh, no, no, no. I'm not into that. I'm I'm into his art. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, I think his art is fantastic. I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that part of the book. This is such a ongoing title that I'm like. We are always in the middle of this series in a classic uh, Kirkmania way. Uh, but this is a this is a fun issue, and the action that happens here is good. It's hard to see the yeah. overarching picture, though. Yeah, the I have a problem with the whole firepower thing, where they're like, I throw fireballs, and everybody else is like, I also throw fireballs, and they're like, we got to defeat this dragon by throwing fireballs at this dragon. It's just not enough for me to. But they're all, <laughs> blah, blah. they're also what, like, I'm the I'm a little bit I'm a little bit worse at it than you. And it's like your fireballs look the same. One of them is blue. <laughs> I don't know. 
Feels you guys like never seen Dragon Ball Z? What the fuck's going on? I certainly have not, but I do like the Chris Sebney art. I agree. Amazon's Attack, number two, from DC Comics, written by Jesse Campbell, art by Vasco Georgiev. We have a teen team that is comprised of Nubia and one, not Wonder Girl, but... Um, Oh my gosh, Yara Flores and Yara, Mary yeah. Marvel and another character that I do not know the name of. Uh, but they are stuck in the middle of the ongoing story of Wonder Woman and being attacked. We are getting some teases, though not full reveals, of characters who previously plagued Mary Marvel in the great New Champions of Shazam series from Love Gypsy that. Cabell. So... I continue to have an absolute blast leaving the series, reading the series, just because it feels like a natural continuation of the Mary Marvel series that Josie Campbell did previously. Uh, I'm having such fun with this. Frankly, this is more fun to me than Wonder Woman is. Whoa. Wow. Okay. There's a take. The uh, would I, I agree with you that this is very good. I love that Mary Marvel is at the center of this story along with the, the Wonder Woman characters. This is maybe the best ensemble action sequence of the week, This the bulk of this issue. Mm -hmm. So I love that. I think it's super well done. Characters that are doing a good job but also not succeeding, great. I don't quite know what the overarching situation is here, and the characters don't as well. So like, I feel like I just need a little bit more information to really get on board, but Man, what a great, uh, really well-written and drawn action sequence in here. Yeah, I mean, a lot goes down this issue. Yeah, we still don't have all the pieces, but I'm appreciative of what we're getting and all that we get in this issue. It's a, it's really action-packed and, 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 and enjoyable. Um, so, yeah, I'm excited to see what's happening, and they're doing a good job building towards that. I mean, to just throw out a theory here, and I understand what you're saying, Justin, but the tease here is we find out that George, Dr. Georgia Savannah, who we met in the new Champions of Sam series, we sat down with Doc Shaner at Baltimore Comic-Con. Mm. He talked about this a little bit. This is straight up Michelle Gomez, the actor. He drew her. Uh, and we're getting her as a villain. I think what we're building up to here is there is a team of villains similar to this team of heroes who is targeting them in the same way that the sovereign is targeting wonder woman over in the wonder woman title so everybody is it's not amazon's attack it's amazon's attacked um and great i'm just having a good time also sleepy bunny there's a sleepy bunny in this yeah but don't uh, don't drop your golden apple mm -hmm. that's yeah Great stuff. Local Man number seven from Image Comics, written by Tony Flex and Tim Seeley, art by Tony Flex and Tim Seeley. In this issue, our local man is continuing to investigate a disappearance in his local town, and he takes some drugs and goes on a little bit of a trip. Don't, don't read this on the train where people can see you. Sure don't. No, you have to. I think that's part of it, oh. Pete. Yeah. Pete, real quick question. This ties into a spoiler of the book, but whenever you have gone to buy a donut, have you confused it with a butthole? Nope. No. You could have never I, been too crispy cream. I hey, have the opposite how problem. How dare you? I have the opposite problem. Every time I see a butthole, I'm like, yum, yum. And put some sprinkles good, on it. Good for you. <laughs> good for you. Um, this is one of my favorite books on the stands. I love this. It's simultaneously funny, great superheroic action, as well as the, in this arc, like getting into some deeper mythology around these characters and like a some horror mystery. The exchange we're talking about with the donut picture I thought was so funny. Shouts to that. Great stuff. Great. Like, they really extend the local man's drug trip here that I just loved how hard they committed to the bit. And it was a, another great read here. Yeah, it's tripped out. It's a ton of fun. It's hilarious. It's insane. Uh, you know, just be careful where you're reading this issue is all I'm trying to say. Look at you worried. You're in an attic. What are you worried about? <laughs> I'm not talking about, I'm just saying, if... You know, if you're going to be in a public place, maybe don't crack this one open. Every day at 3 p.m., a uh, troop of adorable schoolgirls visit Pete in his attic. <laughs> That's uh, true. And hang out and sing him church hymns. 
Uh, mm. And that's always when he's reading comic books. So it's a real I, j- Everyone loves church hymns. I want some non-church hymns. I want some just regular hymns. Just what about some church hymns. hers? You know what I'm talking about? Nice. Oh boy. Thanks, man. I also really love the backup story here. We get a twist instead of a throwback 90s story. We get a focus on one of the other characters in the book, Local Girl. And I thought that was neat. Uh, this book yes. is great. So good. So good. Detective Comics 1078 from DC Comics, written by Ram V and Dan Waters, art by Jason Sean Alexander and Casper Wittgard. Batman has been invaded by a demon and is going to be hung in Gotham City Town Square and everybody is rallying to try to save him. Oops. Spoilers. They don't. This issue. So that's oh, it. For yeah, Batman. Bad news. Last <laughs> issue of any Batman title ever. Wild stuff. Yeah. Who uh, knew our, Detective Comics would end in 1078? Uh, I, I had that on my bingo board. Yeah. I, I just think that the art is just immaculate just unbelievable the panels in here are just so creepy and cool some of them look like paintings really just re- unbelievable i can't say enough about it. this is a total package issue uh loved all the stuff that goes down here this is just a lot of uh cool cameos unbelievable action and uh yeah just a great comic agree beautiful art big storytelling dark it's like a dark oceans 11 where instead of getting a great <laughs> uh bunch of money they're trying to save their buddy from dying and uh it's a great great batman stuff feels just the right amount of out of continuity even though it technically is in continuity lovely <laughs> I just want to give a shout out to the backup story, Dan Waters and Casper Wingard, the team on Homesick Pilots, back together again for a story that that, like takes place in this dark continuity where Batman is about to be hung, but it follows two characters who are like, "Ah, just living our lives and going on a date here in the meantime, wild stuff. Like I love the front story, but that backstory completely got me. Um, This is a great time. You missed it. Yeah, he's doing the DeVito over here. I am. It's a spicy mm. meat of ball, this story, honestly. Are you giving a Giants Tommy DeVito reference? Shouts, <laughs> Pete. Look at you. Come Bringing on. all the continuities together. Predator versus Wolverine, number three from Marvel, written by Benjamin Percy, art by Ken Lashley, Hayden Sherman, and Kay Zama. Speaking of continuity, big spoiler here. The reveal yeah. is that Wolverine's big helmet that he wears as Weapon X is a predator mask. That's where it comes from. That's where they found it. Crazy reveal. Fucked big up. Reveal. I honestly, I called that 50 years, years ago. ago. That's yeah, funny. right. You walked out of the Predator movie and were like, oh my God. Weapon, Weapon X, X, Barry Windsor Smith. Weapon he X. kept saying Barry Windsor Smith over and over again. Alex. Yeah, there's a it's real. That's why he was locked up in your weird attic for many years before uh, <laughs> we started this podcast today on this first episode. But uh, I also, this was great. I love the continuity hits, the different timelines. Wolverine gets savaged here <laughs> multiple times to the point where you're like, no way, this guy lives. And it's like, oh, he does. You forget just how resilient this guy is. Oh, you don't forget that. No, he's like on, Tinkerbell. He's when you best, think he's dead, he does. You know, I, I got, I got to say, back. that's one of my... I, I enjoyed this issue, and I love this series. It's super fun and violent and exactly what you wanted out of a Predator versus Wolverine series. But one of my least favorite things is the thing... I, I feel like it was Mark Millar kind of introduced it, where he's like, yeah, he can get turned into a skeleton and come back from that. Like, what are you talking and it's about? Not, it's not even that. It's when his brain gets fried. You're like, he lives through that? His <laughs> body made a new brain? Okay. That's not a healing yeah, factor. He's immortal. He's an immortal person. Yeah, he's Lobo. Like, Lobo at least is like, who is Space Wolverine, I believe. That is technically accurate. Hold on, let me check the Wikipedia. Yes, Space Wolverine. Uh, That's what he's known as. The idea that Lobo is like, yeah, I can regenerate from one uh, blood cell is stupid and ridiculous but that's what lobo is wolverine to me i like wolverine better and we talked about this with issue one or two because he was getting ripped to shreds by the predator and i like that the fact that he's like jesus christ i gotta hang out in this cave by a waterfall and heal for three days because the predator is killing me here he's like 
Yep, got blasted down to a skeleton. I'm going to be up in a couple of minutes now. And how does it work? Does his face grow back? Like, is his body like, let's grow that brain first. It's important. Or are they like, let's get the face up. Let's finish the face before we get to the brain. Pete, you're the Wolverine expert. You're the, you're the space Wolverine expert and the Wolverine expert. How do you cover both areas, Earth and space Wolverine, so well? Uh, go fuck yourself, both of you, uh, for all your bullshit that you spouted there. Uh, yeah, this is great. I love this issue. Uh, it's kind of fun that they've been battling through all of time and space, it turns out, for many years. So, cool. Uh, I enjoy that. Yeah, I don't have a problem with the things that, uh, you know, they've established. You guys are like, oh, you know, I like comic books, but, uh, you know, some parts, whatever, man. This is who Wolverine Liter- is. Literally Can't our job. Literally what we do. Yeah. Him. It's the first episode, so you might not be familiar with this pattern that we have. And let me say, as the first episode, I'm shocked that my co-host and friend just said, go fuck yourself. Yes, <laughs> that feels extreme. I don't know how to deal with this. I'm, but, I'm yeah. enjoying the art, and also the kind of, like, last panel was fun as well. As uh, long as we don't make you saying, go fuck yourself, a regular occurrence, I'm totally <laughs> fine with it happening this one yeah i gotta say it was worth it for the go fuck yourself alone <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i i had a great time with this great what's the furthest place from here number 16 from, from here. image comics written by matthew rosenberg art by tyler Bergy. boss this is a wild issue because given that we saw sid Having given birth to a baby and fine and understanding a lot of stuff in, I believe, the previous issue, now we flash back and see what happened to her when she got to the city. We have enormous revelations about how this oh, whole yeah. world works. This is, not to keep using this phrase, but an essential issue of this series and another great one as usual. I mean, uh, huge. all in oats, really? That... that... But she's so, a rich girl. Mm-hmm. It's really, ironic. Ironically, Hall and Oates are literally in the news as a, because they're in a huge legal battle. Because I think Hall's trying to sell the rights to Hall and Oates. The fact that this came out this week at the same time, I was like, it is true that they're gods because they're battling each other <laughs> for the just rights. Just to give some context with this, the whole impetus for the series is a bunch of kids live in different factions and different societies. We've been following a group called the Academy who worships records, but they never heard those records. They don't have a record player. And this issue, Sid, one of our characters, finally hears her record Hall of Notes for the first time. I thought that whole sequence drawn by Beautiful. Tyler Boss was gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Uh, yeah. I think, Ty, I mean, this, the, the story is great. The myth- mythology building that's going on here is awesome. I feel like we have so much. I would explore this world for years if we could possibly do it. But I want to shout out Tyler Boss's art, which I think is drawing on Mobius a ton in this mm. issue. It's something that Tyler Boss has such a distinct style, but I feel like sort of reaching for that I thought was such an interesting idea and feel so on for what the area the, for the city that this uh, the characters are exploring now. Great stuff. Green Arrow number six from DC Comics written by Joshua Williamson, art by Sean Isaacs, Phil Hester, and Trevor Hiresign. Green Arrow has been jumping through time and finally the villain who has been manipulating him is revealed. I think you could figure out who it was, but regardless, by the end of the issue, spoiler here, he is back, Um, though, of course, there's lots more to come and lots of twists here. What did you think about the conclusion to this first arc? Worth, Worth it for the kissing alone, is what I would say. Oh, man. Yeah. I mean, I love the kind of... uh slow motion run sequence towards each other that we got there with that beautiful kiss. That was awesome. I was having such a great time until Amanda Waller showed up and started shooting up the place. I was just like, I don't know. I think everyone agrees with you there. Yeah. I just, I didn't like that. Um, So that, that part kind of really pulled me out of it. And, but I was having up a great time up until then. Just Alex. Oh. I said I thought that it was worth it for the kiss alone. Uh, this oh, okay. is a, yes. I also really like the kiss. Story. 
Uh, on the Amanda Waller of it all, they're clearly building this Uber story over the course of DC with Amanda Waller as a villain. There's hints that she's not exactly in her right mind and maybe being manipulated by somebody as well. There's teases of a trinity of evil coming down the pike. So I think there's more revelations to come here. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, it was good. I had fun. I, I liked... I like the mashup of art in this book. Yeah, I really agree. Good, Phil Hester in particular. I just love Phil oh. Hester's art, but I do too. And th- this felt like sort of like Dorothy coming out of uh, from black and white to color. Mm-hmm. I think they did a good job of using the the art transition there. Let's talk about an issue that I would laud as impressive, but I don't think worked. Captain America, wow. number three, Whoa. Marvel, written by J. Michael Straczynski, art by Jesus. Saiz, in this issue, we are following Captain America as he was trying to, he finally, not figures out, but he finally finds out the villain who has been dogging him over the course of multiple decades. There is a demon who has been targeting him as a change agent for America and the world. Um, This change, this demon has infected somebody else who's basically an anti-Captain America who dissolves somebody at a wall. I really like the idea here. It feels mm. like a very JMS idea of throwing out Captain America lives so long, everything becomes condensed down to single moments. So we get to see him investigating this mystery with Misty Knight and a doll of Doctor Strange, which is a very fun detail. Fun. Yep. While... The enemy is, we get to see what the enemy is doing and how they dissolve this guy, disintegrate this guy at the same time. I like the idea. I think the execution was too confusing to read. It didn't quite work for me. Yeah, I especially I think especially in the beginning, it was like a little odd the way it felt a little just stilted the way the pacing of the story went out. And so it, I agree with you. I was like, wait, what happened? They seem so chill with watching a man disintegrate and the villain get away. <laughs> and, and they were more concerned. I feel like the story is more like, don't worry, the Doctor Strange doll is fine. I was like, uh, I think there was more going on there than <laughs> keep a track of your little doll guy. But I... There are a lot of interesting ideas in this issue. I love the flashback stuff and the the overarching sort of narrative connection here that uh, everything is existing all at once really reminded me of uh, Slaughterhouse Five, Mm -hmm. Kurvonegut, Billy Pilgrim's life. And it feels like that's probably what JMS is referencing here. And I like that as an overarching story binding point. It's just crazy that it's like also there's a demon that is possessing different people and eats their their turns their bodies to dust when they or meat dust when they die. Uh um meat dust sounds delicious. Anyways, I I think that the, I liked the kind of uh cap moments in here, uh, especially cap saying frankly I'm a little weirded out. Uh I think that kind of explains a lot of what's going on in this issue. Um yeah, there is a lot going down. There's kind of a lot of different stuff, but overall, I'm looking forward to this kind of showdown with this uh, body possessing devil thing that uh, turns people into meat dust. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm also kind of uh, like Cap a little weirded out. Yeah, I just to be clear, I laud this creative team for trying something that doesn't work in my opinion i would rather have somebody try something weird structurally and fail at it than not try Mm. something structurally at all so that's great uh i also agree with you pete that i think the showdown at the end is great and well deserved and they're teasing in the next issue is not going to go the way that you think it's going to go so that's interesting as to me as well this whole storyline is really fascinating and jesus saiz's art is it feels i don't know it's not dale eaglesham because it's not necessarily quite as cartoony but like it's very well yeah. defined in the same sort of way it's very like a very beefy captain america and the i really like this title a lot i'm curious to see where it goes Beefy to meat dust, that's Cap. 
Swan Songs number five from Image Comics, written by W. Maxwell Prince, art by Alex Ekman Lawn. In this, we are going into therapy. The idea of this series is it's showing the endpoints of stories. I, I got to be honest, I'm not quite sure of the end point of the story other than the guy finishing off therapy, but he bonds with his younger self and explores the things that he liked. This is a very emotionally palpable theme, mm. I thought. How'd you guys feel about this issue? Yeah. I, you, oh. uh, uh, artistically, just unbelievable. There's like collage work in here that's really effective and interesting. The whole kind of like going back in his memory and opening up the safe and a little version of him is in there is awesome. And it's like a fun line of like, what's a condom? Just really great. Uh, uh, create, creative wise, really impressive. Um, but man, uh, and uh, yeah, just it's super type bananas the art. I can't stress that enough. But the tease image that mm. we got at the end of this issue, <laughs> yeah. I lost my fucking mind. I was like, let's go. Come on. I cannot wait. Yeah. I mean, yes. just to mention about that, the last, I agree with you. The last image is like, next issue, it's a parody of where the sidewalk ends. They're like, by the way, it's also an ice cream man tie. And I was like, you, oh my God. Shit, you bastards. <laughs> you how got us. You? It's so good. I'm I'm so excited for it. Uh, the, uh, fantastic. I don't think we're talking about this title enough. We uh, laud Ice Cream Man constantly, and this is just so good also, giving us slightly less uh, doomed characters, which I think is nice. But really enjoy this. And, like, I feel weird because I opened the safe in my house, and there was a tiny Pete inside. What? And Pete, you got to meet this guy. I, I do want to mention it, and I'm sure we want to keeps punching to me. the next title. But <laughs> it is me. I really do think all the time about the flattening out of our experiences as we get older, that when you're yeah. younger, you feel things more strongly, that these are the first time you're doing these things, so this is the most important time you do these things. Like, that's why... We have high school dramas so much. It's like, oh, my God, I'm going to prom for the first time, and I love this person, and I will never love anybody else again. And then eventually, over the course of your life, you realize, okay, there's more experiences like that, and sort of whittles down those emotions a little bit and whittles down those big emotions. And I think that's what this issue is dealing with in a very big yes. way. I love that. Like, I loved not shying away from that. I loved really digging into that. I thought it was very smart and very interesting. Agree. And that's why we reached into the back of our collective safe and found this new first episode of this podcast <laughs> and really are seeing oh it God. from these oh naked God. eyes this for is, the first this time. This is so fresh for me, and I, I just feel butterflies in my stomach. Yeah, exactly. The Flash, number three from prom. DC Comics, written once again by Cy Spurrier, art by Mike Cy guys. Cy guys, by Mike Diodato Jr. <sighs> <laughs> Wally West is dealing with some new powers he's got that allow him to go through. I don't. I don't. I'm sorry. I don't remember <laughs> what the description was, but different like folds pieces of reality. And Max Mercury, who is the guru of speed, is talking him through this issue. Man, I love this series. This is such a insanely different take on the Flash and the powers of the Flash. It is a devastating horror series that gut punches you every single issue. Uh, Cy Spurrier is writing the crap out of this. Mike Dionetta Jr.'s designs are disgusting and terrifying throughout this book. Yeah. This is so good. The good, trippy, this, fun. Yeah. A good trip be fun that really like is coming at Flash in a different way at a time where I'm like ready for some different Flash takes since the Flash family I feel like is is very large and in a lot of different ways sort of doing the same thing. That that's sort of a, a nonsense, but it I think they're they were t seeing the same Flash stories over and over again with the family, and this feels very different and full of ideas. Yeah, I mean, the art is, I know uh, you guys are Psy guys, but I think that the art on this really makes it worth it. I mean, uh, as someone who doesn't like the flesh, the art makes this so much more enjoyable and uh, worth uh, checking out. Yeah, I just wanted to give a shout out. I tried to look up who it was very quickly and I couldn't find it. Um, oh, uh, Hassan Otsmane Elahu. I probably shouldn't have looked that up because I just mangled the name. Uh, but the letters 
the lettering. Yes. yes. So Agreed. good. Yeah. Like, it's and so interesting. The way a lot of the word balloons are even on a toggled, like, sort of yes. uh, I, topography, I guess is the way of saying it. Like, they're bent away from us, which is something you never see. That's really cool. Well, that and also, like, there's so many things that people are clearly saying under their breath, and it's just, like, smaller type for that. Yeah. Uh, great. Like, this is such a good package from top to bottom. Really impressed by this book. Let's talk about Drive Like Hell, number two from Dark Horse Comics, written by Rich Dueck, art by Alex Cormack. This is following a dude who stole a unfortunately demonic car who uh -huh, resurrected his classic. girlfriend. Her head is kind of hanging off. And in happens. this issue, Don't point as out. he drives away from a bunch of demons, he stops at a revival tent and tries to get it exercised. One thing that I really liked about this book is I always expect books to be very derogatory towards religion. This is not, which I was very surprised yeah. about and very impressed about, but also... It, even though they spend a lot of time at this revival tent, it doesn't for the fact forget the fact that it's like Fast and the Furious with demons. Very fun. Yeah. Had a good time reading this. Agree. Oh, Can you just pull up to a revival tent with like some requests? Because that's a fun idea. I anytime I see a tent, I just have some ideas. Yeah. Really? Like in the woods or a revival tent or either one yeah. of those? Any tent can be a revival tent if you yeah. do it right. I I'm always sticking my head in a tent to be like, Can you pray real quick? <laughs> Oh my pray, God. pray real quick. I'm sticking my head in the tent. Can you pray real quick? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God! Yeah, you're like a Bigfoot, but with weirder things to say. Miss Marvel, the new mutant number four from Marvel, written by Iman Vellati and Sabir Perzada, art by Carlos Gomez and Adam Gorham. This is the last issue of this mini series as Miss Marvel battles Orcus on the Empire State University campus. By the end of the issue, if you're curious what Miss Marvel's mutant power is, spoiler, you don't know. You don't know. Spoiler, spoiler. Go to spoiler. Uh, go to bed. You know what spoiler means. Yeah. Uh, that was that was weird. <laughs> I, I was all right, all right. That. Well, all that aside, I thought this was great. I love how uh, I love the art. I love the kind of how fun this is. It's cute. It's action packed. Uh, I, I just think that you know the way they kind of work together to take down the Sentinel team. It's a great use great. of the people that they have around them in a way that isn't fighting each other. I I just think this is awesome. I agree. Like, Iman Vellani shouts to her, like, establishing herself as a legit movie star in the Marvels, and then still writing a fantastic comic at yeah. the same time for the first time. Like, man, what a trajectory uh, she is on right now. This is a great issue. I, the fact that we don't understand the mutant power, fine. Hold on to it if you must. Also, I felt a little forced. They were like, put this bangle on. I was like, all right. The movie already came out. You don't need to yeah, tie into this cool. movie. That, yeah. Uh, but otherwise, like I, I agree with you, Pete. Like the way they took this group of students that are sort of like, "We're mad. Whose side are we on?" And they're like, "No, pay attention. <laughs> this is serious." I was like, "Yes, great." Uh, when she took down that sentinel, it was one of my. I was caught up in that fight to the point where I was like, "I don't know if she's going to do it," and then she does, and I was celebrating along with her. Not yeah. something I do with every comic. I enjoyed this. Yeah, I would love to see them write an ongoing Miss Marvel series. I do yes. hope that happens. My only thing about the mutant power is like, we know it's hard light powers because that's what she has in TV and the movies. Let's just go for it already. I don't know why we're holding back on this. Maybe you'll find here's out. A, here's the thing, though. Do stretchy powers and hard light powers work? Sure. I, I don't know. Th this issue was so much about her stretchy powers. Literally, she's like, this is why I have these powers. I was like... Okay, uh, do you though? Because if you're doing hard light, what's going on? Like, I will say her quite... use of powers in this issue also were like very Mister Fantastic and less Miss Marvel, but it's fine. I had a fun time reading this issue. Stretchy, Let's both stretchy. Move to our last comic of the stack. Oh, right? the last one! Oh, and then, oh, it's all the stack. Wow. How I do we end this? I can't believe we're finishing this up already. The Penguin number four from DC Comics, written by Tom King, art by Rafael De La Torre. The Penguin has been building up his gang over the past couple of issues in order to retake the underworld of Gotham in some sort of 
gang war, if you will. And oh, interesting. It, I love that it's, concept. It's, it's <laughs> very cool. If only somebody would use that in some sort of comic book. No. And in this issue, he heads to Vegas to bond with Vegas, his baby. previously unknown wife, Lisa St. Clair, who he is terrified of. Uh, we get a bunch of twists and turns. Man, I love this series. This is one of my favorite things that Tom King has written in a long time. It feels like very purposely the spiritual successor to Killing Time that was a little more yes. impulsive in the action. I'm having so much fun here. But each issue really stands alone as like uh, just a great story. And like, let me just say, Penguin, same. Anytime I've met up with an ex, I get played. You know, <laughs> I just get a gun pointed at me out of, out of some dude is holding. Uh, I love the different voiceover perspectives we get here, which, again, not easy to do. But we get, like, I think four different narrators at different points. Awesome. Really enjoyed it. This series is great. Tom King continues to never disappoint. Wow. Except, um, for, except for Danger Street. But, yes, go ahead. I like oh. Danger Street. Pete, no, I like Danger no, Street, not. Alex. No, yes. Yeah. We have no, one issue left. No, Alex, you're going to like the end. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah, I, I I, love all the twists and turns. This is fun. This is a, a great book. It's really impressive what they're doing in this. I'm, I keep being surprised by how much of a dick Penguin is. I don't know why I want him to be better, but it's just like they can't you love him. go hard on him just being like, no, I'm a complete douchebag. And I, well, I, he, oh, he's like the Foggy Nelson of DC, sort of. That's funny well, you say that. I, I, to your point, Pete, I love that idea. I love like that. I think that's the essential idea of the series is why is Penguin one of Batman's greatest villains? And this series is showing us that bit yes. by bit, issue by issue. One little side note, I don't, necessarily know if this is true but lisa st Clair, who is his wife that is revealed here she's never been revealed to the comics before there is a character named lisa st Clair who is from romance comics young love from dc comics back in the 1960s ah. and 70s and my theory is that for love everlasting tom king was researching romance comics yes. came across the name uh, lisa st Clair, and he was like Bring her into Penguin. Let's bring her into Penguin. So there you go. Uh, but great. this is great. Bring her into Penguin. That's a way, weird way to. Sexually. He means yeah, sexually. Yeah, I know. Go just... inside of Penguin. That's oh what I mean. Oh, my God, dude. Get in butt. that Penguin. Yeah. Something I donut. say, I say a lot. Inside of his donut. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Something I say a lot, of, especially about people that work at zoos. <laughs> zoo, zoo cruise, if you will. Oh my God! <laughs> if you'd like to support this podcast at all, well, this new you, this all, new podcast, this new podcast that we're trying out, baby, patreoncom slash club Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at seven PM to Facebook and YouTube. Come hang out. We would love to chat with you about comic books. Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and follow the show at Comic Book Live on Twitter. And uh, no, uh, TikTok and Instagram. I don't know. Nice. Good. Anyway, Good. comic book, whatever. Comicbookclublive.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, we'll see you at the Comic Book Club. Is the first time ever I've said that. Wow. Oh, this is fun. We should do this again. But just real quick, when we talked about this, I thought my catchphrase was going to be go fuck yourself. But <laughs> yeah, oh, I read taking. that wrong. I'm sorry. I read that wrong. I apologize. You really, it really sounds good coming out of your mouth, but very offensive to hear it, you know? Uh, I got to say, this episode was uh, tight bananas. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't even remember it. You couldn't even remember the phrase. Don't go.